I'm going to read from Matthew 4, 1 to 11, and then I'm going to read Psalm 19. And these are kind of foundational passages for us this morning. So, if you would, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read Matthew 4, 1 to 11, and then I'm going to turn back and read Psalm 19. The first is the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be, become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only. Only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. And I'm going to turn back to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. And read that as well. Psalm 19 to the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Yes, Lord, as the psalmist prayed, may this be our prayer today and every day this year. Let the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you truly are the Lord, the rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Is there anyone here this morning that's tried to drive a car before without wheels, by any chance? Ever tried to use a cell phone without a battery? Ever tried to grow a crop, farmers here, without water? (laughs) 
Friends, there are some things in life that are absolutely essential. Like wheels on a vehicle. Like batteries in a cell phone. And water for crops. In the same way that we can't get down the road without wheels on a car, there are essential habits that we need in our lives. Things that are absolutely necessary if we're going to move forward in our relationship with God. If the seed that is sown in the field is missing essentials like soil and water and nutrients and sunlight, that seed is not going to grow. And the same is in the Christian life. Dear church, as we start this new year, I'm pressing the pause button on our verse-by-verse journey through the Gospel of Luke. And what I'd like to do for this month is to talk about essentials. Essential practices of the Christian life. There are habits and disciplines that are critical in our lives as Christ followers. And the Lord willing, with God's help, I want us to consider through the weeks of this month seven practices, seven habits, we could call them, that help us grow in Christ. They're essential. They're critical. Now, when I was a young child, five or six years old, I came to know the Lord. I asked the Lord Jesus into my heart to forgive me of my sins. It was Campbellford, Ontario. I was in Booth Street, not far from the Catholic Church and Hillcrest Public School. And the public, public pool, if you've been to Peter, or Campbellford, you know there's a little public pool there, just down the street from where I grew up. And it was a backyard Bible club. And uh, my parents sent us over there and and I also heard the gospel at church, at the little Baptist church there where, my, where we attended week by week. But yeah, I was five or six years old and I asked Jesus into my heart. That was the beginning. That was the beginning of my journey with the Lord. Over time, I came to realize that a long way to go in order to become like Jesus, a long way. <laughs> Through the years, I've learned that the Christian life is more of a marathon than a sprint, Right? Like many of you, I've discovered that God wants to transform my life, your life, from the inside out and make us look more like Jesus day by day. That's what the Apostle Paul calls being conformed to the image of Christ in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. It's this process that requires daily obedience and daily grace. Philippians 1, 6 is a, is a favorite verse of mine. It says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Isn't that good news? He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. When we choose to follow Christ, God begins at that work in our hearts. It's a good work that God promises to bring to completion. And when we die and see Jesus face to face, or when he raptures the church, whichever will come first, that is when the day of completion arrives. Because the Bible says when we see him, we will be, what? Like him. On that day, Jesus Christ, on that day of Jesus Christ, we will be finally done with our struggle with sin. We will move on from the process of being sanctified, which is becoming more and more holy, to being glorified like Christ. Until then, we continue on this track, on this trail of transformation and sanctification. As I start, and we start this new year, I want to talk about seven essential practices for the Christian life, seven biblically-based habits that Jesus modeled for us in his life on earth. And the fact that Jesus modeled these for us is important, because these aren't my ideas, or someone else's ideas, that wrote a book somewhere, is making lots of money. These are God's ideas. This is God's plan for you and for me, for a growing Christian life. So what are the seven essentials? Glad you asked. Okay. I'll read them, but we're gonna, I'm going to read them out now, but we're going to go through them over the course of this month, one by one. Number one, which we're going to look at today, is engage the Bible. Engage the Bible. Number two, speak with God. 
That's prayer. Number three, worship the Lord. Number four, belong to the body. Number five, rest and refresh. Number six, serve. Serve others. And number seven, share the gospel. So, if you didn't get all those written down, don't worry. We're going to be going over them (laughs) one by one all month. And I hope you can be with us all month. Or if you can't be with us in person, that you can watch online, you can join us that way. Is it possible for you and for me to make these seven practices part of our daily and weekly lives? Yes, it is possible. Will there be days that we forget? Will there be weeks, perhaps, that we don't practice these habits throughout the course of 2024? I think we could answer yes to that too. But when that happens, when we forget or when we slide back into an old habit or a bad priority, clean the slate, get up, and move forward. God's not only gracious and merciful, He has given us His helper to help us make these habits a part of our daily lives. January is a good time to look ahead. It's a good time to make a plan with God and His Word. If we don't have a plan, well, what do they say? If you don't have a plan, then you're planning to fail, right? I think, I think these seven practices, these seven habits are a great plan for you and for me to set a course for us in 2024. Now, some of these practices are already part of your daily routine for some of you. But there will be others here I know or listening online that haven't yet made these a core part of their lives or your life. So, you have an opportunity right now as this year begins to reevaluate priorities and get things on the right track. Our example is Jesus. Our guide is His Word and the Holy Spirit. So as we begin this new year, church family, I I want us to consider these habits because I firmly believe that they will help you and they will help me in the most important way possible. And that is our growing relationship with our Maker That is the most important relationship that we have. Not our relationship with our work, not our relationship even with people in our family. The most important relationship for us, not that we neglect those things, the most important though is with God. What did Jesus say in John 17 verse 3? He said, this is eternal life, that they may know you. He's talking to the Father. This is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Folks, if there's one thing I want for you and for me this year at Gilmore, it's this, that we will have a growing relationship with God, that we will know him more personally on December 31st, 2024 than we did today. Not just know about him, because we can get into those routines too, those where we just feeding head knowledge, our heads are getting bigger, but our hearts aren't changing, right? So it's more than just head knowledge, it's knowing God intimately, personally, like you would your closest friend. My closest earthly friend is my wife. I met when I was in high school. I first laid eyes on her. I knew there was something special about her, and I knew that the best way for me to get to know her and for her to get to know me was to spend time together. So I had to figure out, how is that going to (laughs) happen? It really helped when her family decided to start coming to our church. (laughs) And her parents and my parents became good friends. That meant like we had family dinners together under the same roof. And then she started coming to our youth group. And I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. Listen, here's the point. In order for us to get to know God better, we got to spend time with him, Right? Like, you would a best friend. And this is good news. God wants to spend time with you. When you wake up in the morning, you need to know this. There's someone waiting to spend time with you. The one who made the universe. He wants 
to meet with you. He wants you to get to know him. He already knows you and I as as intimately as we can be known because he made us. But he's waiting for us to meet with him and sit at his feet and speak with him and know his voice. And how amazing is that? That the one who made the universe wants to spend time with you and me. It's incredible. Let's let that sink in for a minute. You're so loved. Now, before we even get to the first of the seven essentials, let me say this. It's most essential that we start with a relationship with God. That relationship begins when we acknowledge our sin and our need for His Son, the Savior Jesus Christ. If you're here listening in, either online or you're here in person, you've never asked Jesus to come into your life. If you've never begun begun that relationship with your Maker, that is the essential of all essentials. (laughs) So I need to say that as we begin. I need to remind us all of Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that's how we're saved. It says you will be saved then. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Second thing I need to say at the outset is if you've been wandering away from God, You can renew your commitment to him today. And today would be a great day to renew your commitment to God. as the first Sunday of a new year. No matter what day it is, it's always a good day to be right with God. Amen? Amen. And you could simply pray with me. And I would encourage you, let's just bow our hearts for a moment here. Because if that's you, if that's you, if you've been wandering, or if you've never even asked the Lord to be first in your life and if you never put your faith in his saving the saving work of his son jesus christ you can pray this with me lord god i admit that i have sinned i admit that i have strayed from you and today i repent of my sins and i ask you to forgive me i put my faith in you please come into my life renew my heart and mind fill me with your holy spirit Help me to know you and walk close with you every day. And this I humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for the remainder of today's message, I want to share with you seven reasons why we need to engage the Bible. Essential number one, engage the Bible. For every believer, this is essential. Now, there are more than seven essentials, but, or, and there's more than seven reasons why we should engage the Bible, but for time's sake, <laughs> I had to cut it down. We'd be here for a while today. It's also Communion Sunday, so, which is marvelous. So I have seven reasons why it's important that we engage the Bible, and the first is this. If you have the handout, <clears throat> the Bible claims to be and proves to be God's Word. The Bible claims to be, and it proves to be God's word. And Norman Geisler said this, and I think it was so well put. It claims to be and proves to be God's holy word. The Bible is not just another book. The Bible was written by prophets and apostles of God under the inspiration of God. And the evidence that this book is uniquely divine is astounding. For one, the testimony of Jesus establishes the authority of the Bible. He affirmed that the Old Testament was God's word numerous times, and he promised to guide his disciples to know all truth, and that the Holy Spirit would bring to remembrance all that he spoke to them. The Bible proves to be God's word in a number of ways, including the predictions of biblical prophets, miraculous events, archaeological evidence confirms it. And then there's the confirmation that this is God's word through supernatural unity found from cover to cover. Given that the Bible was written over 1,500 years by more than 40 authors and in three different languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, can you imagine? Can you imagine getting 40 authors in one room and saying, okay, write about a subject? I'm sure you'd get 40 different ideas on a subject. God took 40 different authors over 1,500 years from all different walks of life. 
And that book that was written by His Spirit is the Bible, and there's unity from cover to cover. We can't even begin <laughs> to imagine how incredible that is. Another way that the Bible claims to be and proves to be God's Word is through the transforming power of His Word. I've seen it in my life. I bet if there was a show of hands here, there would be many hands lifted up to say, yes, I've seen God's Word. Powerful. My brother's wife, Jenny, was diagnosed with breast cancer in the summer. She went through several months of chemotherapy this fall. And in December, she started radiation treatments. She's a believer in Jesus Christ, trusting God to heal her and help her through this difficult time. On December 27th, 10 days ago, she was heading into her, one of her last radiation treatments here in Peterborough. And she posted on Facebook, Today I'm suffering with radiation burns and feeling pretty horrible. I can see my flesh failing. But I just read the verse of the day, and it's perfect. It's so timely. You know what the verse of the day was on December 27th, if you have a Bible app? It was Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That's what God's word does. It transforms. It is supernatural. And my sister-in-law, she went to God's word. If she hadn't gone to God's word, she wouldn't have got that blessing and received that gift from God, speaking so personally, so specifically into her life that very hour. I said to Jenny, I was so encouraged by her post and how God's word speaks to us. And, and sometimes those verses that we get Sometimes it's that, that they're so transformative in our lives. They're not just for us. They're for someone else that we need to share with. You ever found that? You read in your Bible someday. And you read a chapter or you read a few verses. And later on that day you bump into someone. And they're going through something. And you get to share with them what you read that morning. And it. It's like the perfect verse that they needed to hear. Again, God's word claims to be and proves to be divine. So we need to engage with God's word, first of all, because it's God's word. Okay, there's no other book like it. We could go on and on on that point, but I've got to move on. I've got six more. <laughs> Why do we need to engage the Bible? Why does this need to be an essential habit in our Christian life every day? Number two, because it communicates the gospel. The Bible communicates the gospel, the good news. Now, sometimes we hear good news on the radio and on, on TV. I, I notice that on the, on the nightly news now, they're usually trying to have a spotlight where there's like some good news. It's usually at the end of the broadcast or something like that, and they, they talk about some baby panda that was born in a zoo somewhere, and you get everybody smiling at the end, or, or, you know, something like that, right? Some good news story <laughs> to kind of balance out like all the other stuff we've just been listening to for half an hour. But the good news stories we hear on earth, no matter what they are, are no comparison to the greatest news story of all. And that's what we call the gospel. And it's detailed where? Here, in the Bible. This is where we read of God's plan to rescue humanity from sin so that we can have a relationship with him. We read of how he made it possible by sending his one and only son to this world that he created and loved. In the pages of Holy Scripture, we learn that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works so that no one can boast. And that when we put our trust in Jesus, we're saved from the consequences of our sins, which is an eternity of torment and hell. We're saved 
from that and for a glorious home in heaven with God and fellow believers. Loved ones, I need to be reminded of this good news every day. And guess what? So do you. Because we need this gospel written on our hearts. We need to see the world as God sees the world. When I open his word, Old and New Testaments, I read about it. I read about God's plan to reconcile lost humanity to himself. It's in every book of the Bible. I read about the effects of sin. And I read about the effects of righteousness. And I'm reminded that the way of self and sin leads to death. And I'm reminded that the way of faith in Jesus Christ leads to life and life everlasting. <laughs> That's good news. And we need to read it every day. <laughs> we need to hear it. Because we don't just engage the Bible by reading. Sometimes we engage it by listening, right? And some of you, maybe you're on a tractor and you listen to the Bible app or something like that. So that's why I put it at engage the Bible and not just read it. We need to engage it. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing. And hearing through what? The Word. The Word of Christ. Romans 10, 17. So engage the Bible because it's God's word. This year, engage the Bible because it communicates the gospel. Thirdly, engage the Bible to know God. Engage the Bible to know God. Engage the Bible to know God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is the central figure of the Bible just as he is the central figure of all history. And here on the pages of Scripture, we discover who God is. Jesus says that the Bible points to Him. John 5, 39, Jesus is saying to a crowd, saying to the Pharisees in particular, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, Jesus says. Jesus says, these bear witness about Jesus, about him. And remember on the road to Emmaus? Luke 24, 27, Jesus is traveling with these two men. They don't really understand that Jesus is with them in the risen form. And he, it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus revealed to those two men the gospel, his life, through the Old Testament. <laughs> As we read earlier, eternal life centers around knowing God. And while we can learn some things about God through nature, for example, we can know that God has the power to create and sustain life. We can see that all around us through, you know, the trees, the birds, and the, the crops that grow. We can understand that much about God. We can learn so much more, though, about God through His Word. The Bible is the primary way that God has chosen to reveal Himself to you and to me. So engage the Bible with eyes wide open. Look for where God is mentioned. Look for where He is described. Like in Exodus 34. I love this passage in Exodus 34. And Moses is wanting to know about God and who God is. But what does God do? He says to Moses in Exodus 34 verses 5 to 7. It says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood, there, stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. How did Moses come to know who this God was that was leading them out of 
uh, Egypt and into the promised land. Well, God told him who he was. Through history, through prophecy, through real events with real people, God shows us the beauty and the glory of who he is when we read his word and we discover it. That's when we discover these things. If you don't want to know the majestic king of kings who loved you, loved you enough to make you, then don't read your Bible. Okay? Just simply don't. If you don't want to know God, don't read your Bible. But if you want to know him who loves you unconditionally, sent his son for you, you must read you must listen to, you must engage with God's Word. Amen? <laughs> All right. You still with me? We're number four. Why engage with the Bible? Engage the Bible because it sustains life. This book will sustain your life. We read it earlier. When Jesus was in the wilderness and hungry after 40 days of fasting, the devil came to him. And Matthew 4 3 and 4 says again, And the tempter said to him, If you're the Son of God, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered, It is written. Let's say that together. It is written. A little louder, church. Come on. It is written. Jesus is quoting the Bible. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. See, I get that's an amen. I love that. Our spiritual life is like our physical life in that we must feed it, but not by food from our fridges and freezers, but rather by the word of God. As John Piper put it, if you think that you have eternal life as a kind of vaccination against hell, which needs no nourishment, you don't know what spiritual life is. What do we we sing as kids? And we've sung it here. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Daryl Dash records in his book on growth habits that the majority of Christians in Canada seldom or never read their Bibles It's incredible. Friends, though, this is the most effective and ignored strategy for spiritual growth in the country, and dare I say, in the world. It's the most effective and the most ignored strategy for spiritual growth in the world, certainly. For God's glory, here at Gilmore, let's not be like Anywhere near that statistic, okay? Let's make the opposite true of us. Do we always remember what we eat? I don't remember what I ate a month ago. But guess what? I know this. It nourished my body that day. Reading our Bibles, sitting under the preaching of God's Word, applying these truths to our lives... These are absolutely essential for growth in the Christian life. You might not always remember what you read the week before. You probably won't remember what I preached in a few hours. <laughs> but, and I forget, I forget what I preached. But I know what I hear from God's word nourished me that day. And will nourish you when you open it and when you engage with it. Right? Right? Praise God for that. So, engage with God's word because it sustains your life. It sustains you. You eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Great. Wow. You wouldn't, you wouldn't just like decide for a while just to not eat and think you could keep going on in life with the same amount of energy and vitality, right? It's the same in our soul. That's why it's called the little devotionals that we give out in the back there is called our daily what? Bread. (laughs) Amen. Number five, engage the Bible for teaching and training for every good work. 
Engage the Bible for teaching and training for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for, four things are listed, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God and the woman of God may be complete for every good work. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Good works don't save us, but good works are the fruit of a vibrant Christian life. And God has prepared good works for you to do. Now, where do I see, receive training for the good works? Where do I receive the teaching that I need and know how to be a good parent or a godly husband or a Christ-like friend? Where do I turn to know how to pray in hard times or how to be a good steward of God's resources? Where do I turn to learn how to care for the marginalized in the community? Where do I turn to learn how to be a righteous leader in an unrighteous society? Where do I turn to discover the wisdom that I need in order to make big decisions like navigating college or university or dating or marriage or the job market? The answer to these questions are found here in God's word because this is the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. All scripture is breathed out by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that you and I may be equipped for every good work. Not some, but all good works. That's good news, folks. But if we don't read it, if we don't engage, we won't be trained and we won't be taught. <laughs> so this is so, so critical. So if I focus on teaching and training in that point, number six, we need to engage in God's word for correction. Because you know what the Apostle Paul said there in, in 2 Timothy Three, it's not just for teaching and training, it's also for rebuke and correction or reproof and correction. So we need to engage the Bible for correction. I don't know anyone that likes to be corrected. Sadly, due to our pride, we usually get our backs up and get defensive. And I don't, I'm speaking from experience. But if we have a teachable heart, and if we want to grow, then we will read and listen to God's word with a humble and open heart. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of, spirit, soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. When King David committed the grievous sin of adultery and murder, God sent a prophet to him, Nathan the prophet. And that prophet spoke the word of God to David. That word of God exposed his sin. It, it pierced his heart to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. And do you know how David responded? He wrote Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Have mercy on me. David responded by repenting and confessing his sin, asking God for forgiveness. Dear church, God loves us so much, he doesn't want us to stay in our sin. And he will use his word to correct us and reproof us. Now, what does that reproof mean? That reproof word means to help us realize what is wrong in our lives. That's what reproof means. His word does that. His word helps us realize what's wrong in our lives. God disciplines those he loves. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't bother correcting you. But he loves you enough and he loves me enough to point out the places in my life and in our lives where we are going off track and we need to get back on track. That's love. 
Hebrews 12, 6, God disciplines those he loves, and he uses his word like he used the word of the prophet Nathan in David's life. Number seven, engage the Bible because it is our weapon of warfare. Engage the Bible because it's our weapon of warfare. Ephesians 6 tells us all about the armor of God, doesn't it? Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The last one listed there in that whole list of armor, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the weapon. It's the only offensive piece of armor in that whole list, isn't it? Arguably. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Listen to these words. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now we often love to quote the last few words of that verse. We'll say, oh, the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. What's so critical is what Jesus said before. It puts it all together. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The enemy of our soul is the devil. He is a liar and the father of lies, Jesus will say just a few verses later. The way to combat the lies is with the truth. The way to combat lies is with the truth, and that's why the Bible is called a sword. Can you imagine sending a soldier into battle without any weapons? Folks, we're in a battle. God has given us his word as a weapon of warfare. The enemy's coming at us. He's coming at the church in general. One of those ways is through false teaching. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. That's 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ who is to judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears that they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We need to gauge the Bible because it's our weapon of warfare. We need to study it and read it and memorize it so that we can recognize the lies of the devil. That we can recognize false teachers. We need to engage God's word daily so that we are prepared for what's ahead. Loved ones, I don't know what 2024 is going to hold for you. Or for me. Well, there's one thing I'm sure of is the enemy's not going to let up on you or me. And he's all, actually, the arrows are already in the air. They're already flying. We need to be prepared. We need to be trained and taught and built up and strengthened by his word so that on those days of trial, and when those arrows land, we're ready with the sword to deal with them. We're ready to respond to the lies with the truth of God's word. Dear church, essential 
Number one, as believers, engage with God's Word. Engage with the Bible every day. It might just be a few verses. Hopefully it's a chapter, you know, but whatever it is, engage daily. Have a plan. Missionary Dean Clark, who we support over in Thailand, years ago said this, and I've repeated it many times. We need a time, we need a place, and we need a plan every day to meet with God. Time, place, plan. Time, place, plan. Same time every day. Same place, if you can. Go to the same place. Go to the same chair. <laughs> Find somewhere comfortable. Open your Bible. Have a plan. I want to encourage you, starting today, read through the New Testament with me this year. If you don't already have a plan, if you already have a plan, stick with it. That's great. But if you don't, join me. One chapter a day, we're going to read through the New Testament, starting today, Matthew chapter 1. Okay? Maybe by next week, I'll give a little thing you can put in your Bible so we can all stay on track together. But one chapter a day, five days a week, will get us through the New Testament this year. Our brothers and sisters over at Auburn Bible Chapel are doing the same thing. As a congregation, going through the New Testament, I think it's a great idea, and I want to invite you to do that with me starting today. One chapter a day. Ten minutes. Open your Bible. Start with prayer. Lord, thank you for your word today. Speak to me through your word. Give me a teachable heart. Help me understand it by the help of your Holy Spirit, the helper. Then read. Then close in prayer. You know what? If you have a couple extra minutes beyond that, bring a pen and a piece of paper or a little notepad. You can get them at the dollar store. Get a notepad and every day from the chapter that you read, write down one verse. Where, where is God speaking to me through that chapter today? One verse that stood out. You know, if you have a little more time, you might write down one thing you learned about God or that you learned about yourself or one thing that you might apply to your life that day. You will be amazed. You will be nourished. And you will help nourish others because God will bring people into your life and you'll be able to share with them. Not out of pride, but you'll be able to share at a place of humility. This is what God has been teaching me. This is where he's been correcting me. He's been training me so that I can be prepared for every good work. And here, let me share with you. Can I share with you <laughs> what God has taught me? Man, I'm excited for what God has in store for us this year as we practice the essentials, which starts with engage the Bible. This book that claims to be and proves to be the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, to forgive us for neglecting this so great a revelation. Find us faithful to meet with you who so loves us and wants to meet with us. You want to speak to our hearts, God. You want to nourish us and you want us to walk close with you and we love that, God, that you love us. Lord, we need your, we're going to need your help. <laughs> Every day we're going to need it. Because there's so many temptations, there's so many distractions, there's so many other things vying to take priority in our lives. But Lord, We know what's important. We've been reminded today. So may we make this, make this such a priority that all the other things that we have to get to in the morning take second place and third place. Or in the evening if we're night people. <laughs> Lord, help us. And we'll thank you, Lord. I thank you for how you're going to speak to hearts this year through your word. We look forward to testimonies, stories of grace, that you be glorified in all of this. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.